Well, good morning. Good morning and welcome to our, our worship on this, the second Sunday of Lent. And also welcome to those not present here in the sanctuary, but to those that we know that are, are joining us by, by uh, participating in this service uh, as it's posted uh, on, the church, on the church website. Um, and these are folks not just here in Bermuda, as part of our own congregation, but uh, interestingly, people from other, from other countries, uh, other parts, parts of the world. A warm welcome to all. Uh, for now, we'll continue uh, worshipping at, at 10 o'clock. Um, at times, the regulations seem slightly confusing and contradictory, um, as whether we're allowed 20% of capacity or 25, but it does seem we're allowed 25%, which allows us to have 90 people uh, here in the, in the sanctuary. So we'll continue during Lent with our morning service at, at 10. And in addition to which, we do have our weekly Bible study, which is done on Zoom, uh, and that's on a Wednesday evening at, at seven o'clock, lasts for an hour. Um, the, it's, it's been produced by a, a member of the International Presbytery, Irene Bohm, we're following that. It has a, a hymn, which is the hymn that we incorporate in our worship, we're closing hymn today, and also the reading uh, for this particular Sunday uh, in Lent. So do feel welcome to, to join in that. As I said last week, we have recently received November's edition of Life and Work, so if, uh, if you haven't had a copy and you'd like to pick one up, then, then please do. And that is also true of the little booklet, the, the upper room. They're both over there next to the baptismal font. And so let us worship God. Let us sing to his praise from the Psalms. We just follow the words as we've done in recent weeks. And Ron will, and Cindy will lead it for us. It's from the Psalms and it's hymn 42. Only on God do thou my soul still patiently attend. Christ appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. Let us pray. Almighty God, we gather this day to offer you our worship and our praise. We gather here in the sanctuary with others who are joining us, and indeed with your whole church in this your world, with its people of different nations and cultures and backgrounds, but gather to offer you worship and praise and to seek to follow in your ways. And so we acknowledge you as creator and sustainer of all life, who through the promptings of your Holy Spirit seeks to guide us in the ways of life. And yet too often we turn away and we engage in that which is destructive and harmful, both of ourselves and of others, and indeed of this earth on which we live where we can be guided by selfishness and self-centeredness, 
our own hopes and ambitions taking priority over your will and hopes for us. And in so doing, we cause harm to ourselves, harm to others, to those of whom we now ask forgiveness and patience, as we ask also your forgiveness for the wrongs we have done and the hurts we have caused, and our failures to stand up for what is right and oppose that which is wrong. Grant us, we pray, the assurance of your forgiveness that we might be freed from the faults, the failings, and the guilt of the past. Help us to discern your presence in our lives and to hear more clearly what it is you ask of us. Help us to turn away from that which is destructive of life and turn towards that which is health-giving and fullness of life itself. Help us to be more sensitive and responsive to the needs of others, both in our midst and far off. Help us to strive for that sense of community which reflects the vision and the hopes of your kingdom. Present amongst us in our midst and yet not yet fulfilled. Help us indeed to grow closer to you that in so doing we grow closer to one another. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The psalm for today is the 22nd psalm, verses 23 to 31. A plea for deliverance from suffering and hostility. We'll read it responsively. I will begin at verse verse 20, 22. 23. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. Stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. He did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted. He did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship him. Dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow down all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. He will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it. Amen. A time of, of music for reflection. Thank you.
Our Gospel reading for today is the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 8, and at verse 31. It's a passage which needs to be put into, into context. It takes place, Jesus having taken all his disciples uh, from the Galilee, uh, north to near what is now the Lebanese border, um, to what at one time was a, a, a temple to the god Pan, and in Jesus' time was the garrisons of the Roman Empire at Caesarea Philippi. And it was there that he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered, some say a prophet, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist. And Jesus asks them, and who, who do you say that I am? And Peter answers, you are the Messiah or, or the Christ. So we continue at verse 31. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose it, who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. May God bless to us the reading of his word. And to his name be the praise and the glory. Amen. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? or as we read it in the, in the authorized version, for what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and to forfeit or lose his soul? This is the passage that we studied on Wednesday evening. And for one of our participants, it, that, that phrase um, in the authorized version, what will it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul, um, brought back memories of watching a film, Man for All Seasons, I don't know how many of you have watched it. Any of you watched Man for All Seasons? It takes you back a bit, it was 1966. Right, so some of you uh, will probably, probably not have seen it. Let me just very briefly um, try and, and put that, that saying in, in, in context. It's about the last years of Sir Thomas More, who was the Lord Chancellor in England in the 16th century uh, under the reign of King Henry the, the, the Eighth. Um, he refused to do two things. He refused to write a letter or support a letter to the Pope asking that King Henry's um, marriage to Catherine of Aragon be annulled. And he also refused to take the oath which recognized Henry VIII as the king and head of the newly formed Church of England. So that's where he found himself in, in, in conflict and, and in trouble. And that early in the, in the film, a young acquaintance of his, Richard Rich, approached him to, to ask him to further his career in court. And Sir Thomas More suggests that instead he become a teacher. And he says that's not for him because that will not give him the status and the prestige that he is seeking. And he wishes to, be, he wishes to further his career in, in court. And to fast forward very quickly, um, Richard Rich joins Thomas Cromwell in, in seeking to have uh, Sir Thomas More prosecuted um, and tried for his refusal 
both to support the annulment and to sign the, the oath, the oath of allegiance. And ultimately, Sir Thomas More is imprisoned in the Tower of London, but he uses as his defense silence. In other words, he will not say why he will not support the annulment and he will not say uh, why he will not take the oath of allegiance. And being an experienced judge, he knows that silence can be taken for uh, assent or consent. So he cannot, cannot be found guilty. And Cromwell's partner in all this, Richard Rich, the young man who wished to become a, an important figure in court, has been going, at one point Sir Thomas More asked for some more books that he might read when he's in the Tower of London. And that rather backfires because Richard Rich goes and takes away the very books that he has. But when it goes to trial, when Sir Thomas More goes to trial, and it's Thomas Cromwell who is, the, who is prosecuting, he eventually calls Rich uh, to testify. And Rich falsely testifies that Sir Thomas More had said to him that the reason that he will not sign the oath of allegiance is because Parliament does not have the authority to declare Henry as king and head of the church. And with that, he is therefore convicted of treason and sentenced uh, uh, to, be, to be beheaded. See, it's a false testimony, false testimony by Richard Rich, but it was a testimony which was to be conclusive. And with that testimony, Thomas More turns to him and says, what does it profit a man if he gain the whole world but loses his soul? He also adds, but for Wales, because Rich's, uh, Richard Rich's award for testifying was that he was made Attorney General for Wales. So I know some of our Welsh members may not be greatly taken by that, <laughs> but for Wales, but they're on a high anyway because they won the Triple Crown yesterday by comprehensively beating England, so they can, they can, they can take it. Okay, so that's, that's what that that's what that was about. And for Thomas More, it was because of his faith and, and his belief in the authority of the, of the Roman Catholic Church and, and indeed of the, of the papacy. So it, again, against everything that he believes, his faith and his integrity, uh, to sign the, the oath of, of allegiance. But what in fact does the passage mean in its, in its, original, its original context? Well, one of the interesting words in the passage comes right at the beginning when he says, Jesus says, then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes and be killed. That's sometimes taken to, to, to suggest that, that the mission of Jesus, and in a sense the mission of his disciples, was a mission of suffering and death. That was, in a sense, what he was here for. And, of course, in the, in the history of the church, especially as the theology of the church developed, that sense of must referred to the, the, the need for Jesus' death and crucifixion in order to achieve the atonement for our wrongdoing and for our sins. But, you know, that's, that's not really there in Mark's Gospel. That was a, a sort of much later development of, of, of thought. It's maybe hinted at but it actually means something, it means something rather, rather different. In a sense, it's not so much prediction, but an analysis of, of, of the reality of, of history. If you remember, there's passages in the book of Chronicles and, and in the Psalms, this verse. They mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and scoffed at his prophets. And there's a sense there in Chronicles and in the Psalms and, and within the Old Testament generally that the very people of God, the people of Israel, the very people of God were constantly opposed to all that which came from God himself through his prophets. In other words, those that, that represented God's presence were opposed by, by his very, very people whom they persecuted down through the ages. And in later Judaism and Jewish writings and, and thinking, 
it was an absolute given. It was an absolute given that, that anyone who sought to speak for God and, and revealed what came from God would be opposed by his, own, by his own people and be rejected and be persecuted. And Jesus and, and perhaps his disciples would certainly be aware of that, that Jesus, for the stance that he was taking, would, would know the opposition that he would receive and, and what would befall him. But I suggest that his mission wasn't so much a mission of suffering and death. His, his mission was a mission of life and of healing. And if, if, if we look at the preceding chapters, there are the numerous illustrations or accounts of that. Uh, the people that he healed, the people that he brought into fellowship. His mission was very much a mission towards those that were stigmatized for their sinfulness and therefore excluded were to be welcomed and reconciled. Those that suffered were to be healed. And there was nothing in Jewish law which, which really justified that suffering continued when it could be alleviated. Nothing in, in their legal system. His mission his mission was a mission of, of life and of healing, not so much a mission of suffering and of death. Of course, that very mission of life and of healing brought him into conflict with the authorities, with the religious authorities and ultimately also with the secular authorities. It brought him into conflict because it offered a transformation, a different way of doing things, a different way of living, a different way of ordering and structuring the society. And so it got the opposition of those that were indeed perfectly happy with the status quo. And so too perhaps uh, today, the church's mission, just as the mission of Jesus himself, is not a mission that seeks to go out and embrace suffering and death. It's a mission that seeks to promote life and, and healing. Yes, it may well, it may well attract conflict and, and opposition. And remember when Mark is writing his gospel, it's in all probability known to Mark and indeed to his listeners and readers that they're aware of the martyrdom uh, both of Jesus' brother James and of Peter, of Peter himself. And so they can see that faithfulness to, to the mission in which they are engaged can well bring about death and, and martyrdom. But I think it's worth reflecting just on that notion that his mission is not one of suffering and death and going out to seek to embrace that. It is indeed a mission of life and of healing. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us offer now our prayers of thanksgiving and our prayers for others. Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your many gifts and blessings to us in our lives. For the opportunities and hearing and of learning of the ways of truth and of life. For the invitation through being part of your church and the privilege of that invitation to seek to live out the values of your kingdom. To work for healing and the alleviation of suffering and a welcoming and embracing of those that are rejected and cast aside. We give thanks for the example and the courage of the prophets, for the obedience and faithfulness of Christ himself, and to the saints and others in the church who have held steadfast to their faith, for those in church life today who are persecuted for that very faith, but who seek to live out these ways of healing and of life. It is in Christ's name now that we offer our prayers for others. We pray for those parts of your world church where faith does indeed attract persecution and resentment and for some death itself, for others imprisonment. We give thanks for their courage and their obedience and hold them in our prayers. 
We pray this day for our families and for our friends and ask your blessing upon them that they may know your peace, a peace which comes not necessarily through a peaceful existence, but a peace that comes from that deep faith in you and in your ways. We pray for those whom we know are ill at this time, for there are members of our congregation who are ill and in hospital, and we hold them in our prayers. And pray for those who care for them and support them, all who work in health, and social services, those who support the elderly who have become frail. We remember too in our prayers those who are lonely or anxious, though surrounded by others, may they know your peace and may they be surrounded by friendship. We pray too for those who have been bereaved, both in recent weeks and months and indeed years, who live still with that sense of absence and miss the company of loved ones. May they be touched by the healing of your Holy Spirit. We pray for those who wield power in this, your world, in our own society and in the nations of the world. May they never abuse that power. May they seek to serve rather than be served. May they be men and women of integrity and honesty. May they reflect the values of your kingdom and the concern for the most needy and vulnerable. We pray for those whose lives are so very different from our own, those caught in the midst of violence, of war, those who will go hungry this day, those in our own society who are struggling with poverty and lack of work at this time. And we remember always those no longer with us, but whose love we were privileged to know. May we never think them far from us, for we share a fellowship and a communion with them still through the mystery of that fellowship and communion that we have in you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The offering can be received either as you enter or, or leave church. We will, we will dedicate it in prayer now. Let us, let us pray. Almighty God, in your name we dedicate this, our offering, praying that it may be a symbol of our commitment to live in your ways and to work for the growth and the signs of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray together now and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The hymn which accompanied our Bible study and our Bible reading for today, hymn 644. O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve you to the end.
Let us stand for the closing benediction, after which we will just recite quietly the words of Go Now in Peace. Go in peace, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you and all whom you love, this day and always. Amen. Go now in peace, never be afraid. God will go with you each hour of every day. Go now in faith, steadfast, strong and true. Know he will guide you in all you do. Go now in love and show you believe. Reach out to others so all the world can see. God will be there, watching from above. Go now in peace, in faith and in love. Amen.